Good evening, everyone. The time is now seven o'clock and it's a Tuesday night, which means it is time for another one of our Military Aviation Museum webinars. I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the Military Aviation Museum, and it's my pleasure tonight uh, to bring to you Colin Heaton. Um, our guest tonight is a prolific author who has written extensively from oral histories and conducted in-depth archival research to assemble a number of just absolutely phenomenal books. Um, tonight's presentation, though, is going to focus on the men who fought, flew, and survived the Messerschmitt ME262. Um, many of those of you out there know that there is a replica 262 in the museum's collection, and uh, it's an airplane that we're very proud to have, though we see it somewhat infrequently because of the challenges of operating it from a grass runway. Uh, but operational challenges is something I'm sure we'll be hearing plenty about this evening uh, as they were a feature of the ME262 throughout the course of its story. Uh, please welcome tonight's speaker, Colin Heaton. Colin, thanks for Hello. being here. Oh, thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. We're ready to get started whenever you are. I'll, I'll advance the slides anytime you say next. Okay, well, the first slide is uh, Professor Dr. Willie Messerschmitt, who most people with aviation knowledge know was one of the premier aircraft designers of the 20th century. Uh, his 109 became legendary, and he was asked to build an airframe that would possibly be able to carry the new version of the Ohine jet engines. And so he designed the airframe as a straight winged version at first, uh, but he realized that it wasn't going to fly properly with Fritz Vendel at the controls set, telling him that it was totally aerodynamically too challenging. So he said, well, let's try angling the wings back 18 degrees. And they did that, mounted the original engines, which were BMW models, not the UMOs. And uh, so they mounted those engines on and uh, with a traditional engine, with a propeller piston as a backup and took it off, flew it, and found it to be aerodynamically better with the, with the uh, angled wings, which was not a design uh, by intent. It was simply an accidental change to accommodate the engines. And when they found out that uh, the BMW engines were providing a lot of thrust, but they were burning out after one or two missions on training, they went to the UMO, uh, engines that were developed by Dr. Anselm Franz for the Junkers company and found that they were much better engines. They had a higher thrust rate. They were more reliable, if you want to use that as a, as a term. But uh, they were still in the early developmental stages of, of uh, metallurgical science. It was, uh, they had steel, they had high grade steel, they had tungsten steel. They had aluminum alloys, but what they did not have was a steel that could absorb that much heat without warping and bending. They didn't have cobalt. Cobalt is a critical ingredient to making a very high tensile strength steel that can take a lot of heat. Uh, that was in very short supply. In fact, the largest supplier of cobalt available was in Sweden, and that was a neutral country where they still got iron ore to make steel, but they did not have cobalt. So finally, after engines a few years worth of uh, practice training and uh, examination, it went through a pretty thorough peacetime style developmental process. But the problem was that the war effort was far exceeding the pace that the aerodynamic uh, testing could support. So by 1944, after three years of delays for various reasons that I'll explain later, when it finally entered combat, it was still an aircraft that had a lot of problems. It had a lot of bugs in it. So the wizards on the flight line were fixing problems as pilots were finding what they were. Uh, I'll give you an example. They delivered uh, several 262s to Adolf Gottlin's unit, JV-44, with engines complete. The problem was they weren't wired. And Walter Kropinski, wanted to get his mechanic who was a master electrician he said can you wire this aircraft and he says yes i can wire it if i have a diagram so gallen calls up berlin and he talks to Erhard mills and he says hey uh, can you tell mr schmidt to send me a wiring diagram for these and he says we can't send you a wiring diagram that's top secret 
<laughs> well, you send me these jets, but I can't fly them because they're not electrically wired. So there was a dance around that. Goering got involved and he got the wiring diagrams. That's just one of the many little simple, silly stories that helped really slow down the introduction of the jet during the war, not to mention the political infighting. And the next slide shows the uh, 262 in its truest form. There are several variants. You had the ME 262A, then you had the B model, and then you had the night fighter version, the two seater trainer slash night fighter version. And this version you see here is the classic, what was called the Schwalbe, or in German, the Swallow, which the Germans never called it that. That was the Allied pilots gave it that name, actually. And uh, so when Gallen first flew it, he was flying a tail dragger version. The nose wheel did not exist until late 43. In July, in July of 43, uh, Gallen took his second flight. And on, now on the second flight, Adolf Hitler was in attendance. And it's a very famous story about Hitler wanting to know, can it carry bombs? And Mr. Schmidt told him, sure, yes, it can carry uh, about 1,000 kilograms of bombs. And of course, Hitler's thinking that he has this new jet bomber. But the story is a lot more complicated than that. And as Hitler's going into his mind about cost, production, requirements, he's talking to Gallen. And Gallen told me personally during one of my interviews with him, he said he told Hitler that we need to stop producing Messerschmitt 109s, focus on the FW190 piston fighter, and then convert all of the other assets that we were using to make 109s and take those resources and throw them into the jet program. And Hitler actually agreed to that. Next slide. Okay, that's another version, and it displays two 250-kilogram bombs, which are underneath the 262. Now, the first unit to actually operate this as a bomber was a, a group of KG-54, a Kampf Kampfgeschwader, bomber wing uh, 54. And the unit was commanded by uh, a major, later colonel, by the name of Wolfgang Schenk. And I interviewed Schenk uh, a couple of times. And, uh, and they actually loved it. But the problem they had with it was the aircraft was so fast that it was very hard to get bombs accurately on target. Heinkel came up with a solution when he was in competition for the contract. And he had his uh, jet version that he thought would compete with Messerschmitt. But the aerodynamic capabilities of it as a fighter were, were not as acceptable as compared to the 262. So they did produce limited numbers of them as bombers, but predominantly the jet contracts went to Messerschmitt. The airframes were relatively easy to put together. They were built in seven different factories so that if one got bombed, you weren't out of production. And they would piece them together and they would put them on trucks, uh, in boxes, get to the airfield. And most jets were arrived in, arrived in crates. Some were flown in after being assembled, but a lot of them were arri arriving on trucks. And uh, they built them on the spot. And uh, the next slide, please. Now, this is uh, Lieutenant General Adolf Galland. He, uh, he was a very re remarkable guy. He was the first, uh, he was the second recipient of the diamonds to the Knights Cross with Oak Leaves and Swords. His best friend, uh, Werner Mulders, was the first, uh, also a fighter pilot. Both of them served in the Spanish Civil War between 1936 and 1939. And in fact, uh, Mulders came in to replace Galland as the commander of the uh, HE, the Heinkel 51 fighter squadron. Uh, Mulders was killed in a crash in December of 1941 when he was appointed general of the fighters. He was only a colonel, but he held the title. Gallen was, was a major promoted to colonel in 1941, December, but by January, well, my mistake, by February of 42, he was a brigadier general, uh, a brevet, meaning temporary, until later that year when he became a brigadier and then he became a major general. And then the following year, he became a lieutenant general. And he was, uh, at the time, only 32 years old. But he'd already scored uh, 100, 100 victories against the Western Allies between the Battle of France uh, and the Battle of Britain, including a couple of victories he had in Spain. And uh, as General of the Fighters, he saw an opportunity. And the opportunity was to take this new technology as Germany was losing the air war. And no one would openly say that uh, without fear of being shot because that was considered anti-war anti defiance. But Gallen 
told Goering, he said, we need these jet fighters. We need to talk to the Fuhrer, and Hitler needs to release these as fighters. We can't have him thinking these bombers are going to win the war. We're getting bombed out of existence, and we need these to use against the bombers while the Focke-Wolves take care of the fighters. And uh, Goering interceded, and then so they went forward and had a few meetings. Two became legendary. One became almost fatal to Galland at Lutzow and Steinhoff and some of the others who were involved because of the... Uh, well, let's just say the arrogance of Hermann Goering, uh, not wanting to be lectured to by men who had risked their lives on numerous occasions only to, to be dictated to by a guy sitting comfortably in Berlin and hammering them for not getting the job done. So the revolt led to Galland being fired as general of the fighters. The 262 program, having the brakes put on that in November of 44 for a short time until the January meeting of 45, which was the second meeting, when Hitler finally interceded and said, okay, if Galen believes he can do this, let him form his own unit, let him lead it, and if he dies in combat, fine, but if he if he's successful, all the better. Next slide. Now, this is an old photo of Hermann Wilhelm Goering. Now, Goering in, in World War One was a very very successful fighter race. He flew with Manfred von Richthofen and Oswald Bolke. Uh, when when Bolke was killed, Richthofen took over command of the Yasta. When Richthofen died, Goering took over command. Goering was a good pilot, but he was a terrible leader and he was a terrible tactician. And the losses under his command rose considerably because he was just not a very good leader of men. Uh, but because he was a recipient of the Pour le Merite, the Blue Max Medal, awarded to the top fighter Erwin Rommel during the war of the Nazi party. In fact, he was wounded in the groin in the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch, where the National Socialist rose up against the Weimar government. And in exchange of gunfire, he became wounded in the groin and as a result became addicted to morphine. So therefore he was a drug is less than lucid decisions. Next slide. <clears throat> now, this is Major General Dietrich Peltz. I knew Peltz fairly well. And Pel Peltz was like Galland. He was a young general, major general, around 32, 33 years old. Uh, he was a bomber pilot. And he commanded uh, a unit called KG, Kampfgeschwader uh, 200. This was the most top secret unit in the German military because this was the unit that was using the newest inventions in the air war. Outside of the night fighter force, these guys were using the Fritz X, which was a radio, a radio controlled gliding bomb. In, in effect, it was the first cruise missile. And he was given the task of, of testing it in combat. And he did when they sank the Italian battleship Roma to keep it out of allied hands in the Mediterranean using a Fritz X. Uh, but he, he was a very successful bomber pilot. He was a very good leader of men. Uh, but he also wanted the 262 for his bomber boys. He didn't want Gallen's guys getting their hands on it. And those two guys went head to head for two years over this project. And uh, finally, that big meeting, the first meeting in November 44, all the bomber leaders and fighter leaders were together. They pitched their cases to Goering. Goering's secretary took the notes. Goering took it to Hitler, and then Hitler decided that Gallen had a valid point, half fighters, half to fighters, half 262 to bombers. Let Peltz and Gallen do their thing, and let's see who's the most successful. Next slide. Okay, now this is Werner Bombach. Werner Bombach was the deputy under uh, Dietrich Peltz. Bombach was an incredibly, insanely brave bomber pilot. He flew Stukas, he flew JU-88s, HU-111s, uh, FW-200 Condors. I mean, the guy was radically crazy. Uh, and in fact, his audacity cost him his life later after the war when he crashed an aircraft in South America. But Bombach was a dedicated bomber pilot. And Bombach was one of the guys who, along with Dietrich Peltz, and you'll find this interesting, we all remember the April uh, 1942 doodle raid on Tokyo. Well, remember Franklin Roosevelt, when addressing the press, said, and answering, where did your bombers take off from? He said, oh, they took off from Shangri-La. Uh, 
He wouldn't tell them it, they took off from the carrier Hornet because he didn't want them knowing that a carrier could carry B-25s. It was a big secret. But Peltz and uh, Bombach had read Doolittle's PhD thesis <laughs> in the 1930s. And they came to the conclusion that Doolittle had flown off of a carrier and they, and because Hitler wanted to know how the hell do they bomb Tokyo? Oh, he flew B-25s off a carrier and the admirals or Raider and Dennis and some of the others said, you can't fly a bomber off a carrier, it's impossible. And uh, they said, no, we, we, we think he did. And uh, so history proved their, their intuition was correct. But Bombach also was an advocate of using the 262 as a bomber. Although he was also very, uh, ex, uh, you know, very keen on testing the Arado, which was successful in that role, and, and the Heinkel version, but the Arado was better. And he said, no, let's just give Galland his 262s. We'll take the Arado, uh, and we'll, we'll use the Arado bomber uh, because it's, it's a better bombing platform. It's not as fast, and we can, it's more stable, and we can use that. And Pellets acquiesced and loosened his grip on it. Next slide. Now, this was Hayo Herman, and uh, I knew Hayo very well. In fact, I have some good pictures of us killing about six bottles of nice red wine at his dinner table. Uh, Hayo was a magnificent bomber pilot, and he created a unit called the Ville de Sol, the Wild Boar in 1943. And he, the unit he created became a German night fighter force using single seat fighters at night with no radar on board and nothing but radio communication and searchlights to shoot down bombers. He also test flew the 262 and was an advocate for keeping it along with pelts at first as a uh, bomber. But he also pushed the issue of using the 262 as a night fighter. And he saw the downside of the 262 being a night fighter and the upside. The two downsides were that the engines gave off a nice bright glow, which was really a nice target indicator to gunners on Lancasters. So that was not a good thing. Plus, the speed was so high that you had to have immediate target acquisition or you're going to blow through or blow past your target. But he did like the concept and it did go into service uh, as a night fighter uh, in limited numbers, very limited numbers. About 32, I think, actually operated as night fighters, uh, throughout, uh, 40, late 44 through the end of the war. Next slide. Now, this was, uh, Major Walter Novotny. Novotny's a very interesting character. He was killed in 1944, November 8th, actually. But when, in November of 44, when, uh, Gallen was given permission, November 2nd, actually, Gallen was given permission to create a jet fighter unit to test his theory that the 262 was a good fighter, he had to pick someone to command that unit. And the first person he thought of was Walter Novotny for three reasons. One, Novotny was a very successful fighter race. He had 255 victories at the time. He had just been awarded the diamonds to the Knights Cross the year before. He was Austrian and he was one of Hitler's favorite pilots and Hitler loved him personally. So he figured that if he takes a successful pilot with good propaganda value that Hitler likes, is successful and has good leadership skills and the men love him, he can't lose. So he created a unit with 12 jets at first called Commando Novotny stationed at Akmer. And Commando Novotny later became JG7 uh, after Novotny's death. And the man who killed Walter Novotny, Edward Hayden, who was a good friend of mine, and in fact, the new book I just finished has his full interview in it. Uh, Hayden had no idea that when he killed Novotny that day over his own airfield, that he almost changed history because when Hitler learned of Novotny's death, he almost killed the jet fighter program. And Galland had to immediately put someone in charge and say, get back up in the air, shoot down bombers and help me prove this will work. And the man he put in charge on the spot, just as the fires were being put out on Novotny's aircraft, was Georg Peter Ader. He promoted him, put him in command temporarily, and they went back to work. Next slide. Now, this is Kurt Welter. Now, Kurt Welter is one of the least known people in the German military, but he's one of the most important. Kurt Welter was a very successful, what they call an old school pilot. Uh, he started out like most of the pilots flying gliders and then canvas bag stick and rudder aircraft. Uh, 
Kurt Welter jumped on the concept of taking the jet into the skies at night. He was originally already operating his NJG-10 Nachtjagdgeschwader. He was operating that using Messerschmitt 109s and 190s that were left over from JG-300, which is what the Wildsau became. He took those, and that's how he recruited Jorg Chipianka, who wrote the for, one of the forwards to my book. And Jorg uh, was the first uh, 262 jet pilot to scurry victory at night, uh, confirmed victory at night over a mosquito near Berlin. And Commander Commando Belter was very successful. They were the most successful uh, night fighter unit outside of NJG-5 and NJG-2 used, who used radar. These guys didn't use radar. They were sight hunters. And uh, Commando uh, Kurt Belter himself uh, had an unconfirmed around 32 victories, but confirmed we have him down for about 21, I believe. But he was a very charismatic leader. Uh, he was one of the very few people who stood up to Goering when Goering called the Commodores in and said, OK, we're going to start drafting 16 year olds and putting them in flight school and you're going to put them in the air. And Velter and Galland and some of the others uh, said, we're not doing it. That's murder. We're not going to kill these boys. If we lose the war, we lose the war. But we're not going to kill these young men just to satisfy your need to throw numbers in the air. And that was a big problem. And for, well, for them, because Goering wanted, wanted Luce Sullivan Gallon shot, and Velter and Seinhofer banished. But Velter stuck to his guns. When he got a new pilot in, he would look at his flight log. If he had less than 100 hours flying time, he wasn't even putting him in the cockpit for a check ride. And that hurt his unit, perhaps, operationally with numbers, but he wasn't going to throw unqualified, untrained boys into the air to die needlessly. And for that, I think he should deserve a lot of credit. Next slide. Now, this is my main man, Jorg Chipianka. He's a great guy. He's still alive, lives in California, got a great wife, a big mansion, and uh, living large, driving his BMWs. He goes on the racetrack at age 96 and still drives fast. He uh, started out the entire war as an instructor pilot, and he was one of the best in the Luftwaffe. And because he was such a good instructor pilot, they would never let him fly combat. And in Jorg's own words, I didn't want to fly combat. I didn't want to kill anybody. <laughs> and I didn't want to die. I just wanted to train people to fly. Well, in 1944, that changed because he got his orders uh, to join Commando Velter, flying Messerschmitt 109s uh, at night, and then they got the jets. Jorg checked out in the jet. And one of his missions, he scored that mosquito kill over Berlin, which has been memorialized in artwork and mentioned in my book and on my website. Uh, Jorg also has a, a notable distinction of being the only guy to ever fly that jet without consistently wanting to wear a parachute. Don't ask me why, that was his proclivity. Uh, but Jorg is a very unique character and he's a good man and hopefully you guys can get him into your uh, museum for a live symposium. He speaks flawless English and he's a very entertaining character. Next slide. Now, this was the July 43 test flight where Galland was there with several of the prominent people in the Third Reich. Uh, this was the very event where Hitler came and was looking at the jet and asked about the bomb issue. And Galland flew the tail dragger. And that's when uh, he had a talk with Fritz Wendel. And he said, what's the possibility of putting some nose gear on this thing? Because I can't see where the hell I'm going. And, and it's getting pretty, you go pretty fast on a runway. <laughs> And so they talked to the designers and Messerschmitt changed the configuration to put the tricycle landing gear on it, which made it gives it the iconic look that we know today. And uh, this event here was what uh, really started the process. Uh, exactly a year later, uh, the first two six twos would make their first uh, aerial kills in Western Europe. Next slide. Now, this was Colonel Gutter Lutzow. Lutsov was a very remarkable person. He flew in the Spanish Civil War with Galland. He received the oak leaves and swords to his Knight's Cross, had well over 100 victories confirmed. Lutsov was, in Galland's own words, the most stern, serious man I ever knew and the calmest person I ever knew in my life. Even in combat on the radio, he was calm. 
The only time he got upset and foamed at the mouth was when he just he he would discuss his hatred of Hitler and Goering, which he did to Goering's face. Hence, Lutzow being ordered to be shot. Hitler intervened on his behalf. Uh, Lutzow was with J with uh, Gallen's JV44. He was his executive officer at that time. Uh, he flew all the way until uh, around April of 45 when he was shot down and killed. Who killed him is still in great dispute. Uh, the location of his aircraft has yet to be determined because it was never found. But there were only three 262s missing on that day that he never returned. And we're pretty sure we've narrowed it down to perhaps a handful of pilots who claimed 262 damaged uh, on that day. But Lutsov was one of the true heroes who again said that he would not allow children into the aircraft to die because Goering wanted to impress the Fuhrer with numbers. He was one of the good guys. And by the way, just so you know, Lutsov learned of the Holocaust along with Gallen and the others. When Hannes Trotloff discovered Buchenwald and called Gallen, and they saved the 168 airmen that were going to be exterminated, shot and cremated by uh, the SS on Himmler's uh, personal order. Lutsov was so shocked at it that he said, I should just go shoot that bastard, meaning Himmler myself. And then Gallen said, what good would that do? He's got 400,000 right behind him. So he was one of the good guys. Next slide. This was Johannes Steinhoff. He was such a great guy. I loved him personally. He was a good man. His family is still good friends of mine. Johannes uh, was the operations officer for JV-44. Prior to that, he had spent his whole career up until 1943 with uh, JG-52, flying from Poland, France, the Battle of Britain. And then later he was given command of JG-77 in, in uh, Italy after the Allies took over North Africa. Uh, Steinhoff, uh, was notoriously anti-Nazi with regard to Hitler and, and Goering. And uh, let's just say that Goering didn't like seeing him walk into a room. Uh, once uh, Steinhoff had to come into a room with Goering and the others in a meeting, and he was only a captain, and he had just received his Knight's Cross, uh, he had to give a situation report on the channel front. And uh, as soon as Goering saw him, he said, sit your ass in that chair, little man, and don't say a word unless you're spoken to. He detested Steinhoff, and it went both ways. But Steinhoff was another one of the good guys. And Steinhoff, actually, when he uh, was asked by Gallen to help him recruit people for the JET program, the first thing he said was, well, we need to find people who aren't assigned. Where can we find people who are not assigned? And Steinhoff said, go to the hospitals. All the, all the guys wounded are laying there doing nothing. So they go to the, they go to the big hospital near Tergensee, and who do they find? Walter Kropinski. Well, they, he'd flown with Walter for three years in JG-52 on the Eastern Front and the Channel Front. And they've got five or six guys in the hospital with casts on their legs or bandages on their heads or arms in slings. And he says, hey, how soon uh, are you going to be able to get up and walk around? They'd talk to the doctors. And the doctors give a prognosis of four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. And Gallen would personally sign their auth release authorizations, get them out of the hospital, take them to a barracks that he had secured for them, let them heal up, and then put them in the jets. So that's a pretty good story. Uh, it's kind of one of those chuckle joy. It's one of the stories you laugh about over a few beers. Next slide. Now, this was uh, Colonel Heinrich Baer. Colonel Heinrich Baer uh, later became uh, the tactical officer for JV-44. For JV uh, Baer had 236 kills, I believe, uh, during the war, and he became a very adept jet fighter pilot. In fact, he had 16 victories in the jet, and he's credited with having the most official victories. There are a couple of guys with more victories, unconfirmed claims, but he has 16 confirmed victories in the jet, almost all of them bombers. I think three were fighters. Heinrich Baer was also one of the uh, Oak Leaves and Swords recipients, and Heinrich Baer was also one of the guys I would classify as one of the good guys. In 1944, he shot down a B-17. The name on the plane was Hens Revenge, H-E-N-N-S, apostrophe S, Revenge. Look it up. And uh, he shot the bomber down. It crash landed. The crew were pretty okay. There was, I think there was one killed and there were some wounded, but most of the crew were pretty good. So he drove to the site. When he got there, the villagers were so enraged over being bombed that they were about to lynch and shoot and, and just basically impale this this crew 
And uh, Bear took his pistol, fired it in the air, and he said, you lay one hand on these Americans, I'm going to shoot you my damn self. They're airmen, they're prisoners, they're mine, get away. So he saved their life. And uh, he died in a plane crash in 1957 in Brunswick, Germany, doing a demonstration flight on a light aircraft. But uh, again, he's one of the guys, I would consider him one of the good guys. Next slide. Now, this is Major Heinrich Ehrler. He also flew with JV-44 in the jet. Uh, he had a, he, at first, he went to JG-7 after Novotny's death because his compadre and went one of his wingmen, Theodore Weissenberger, later replaced Ader as Commodore or the commander of JG-7. Uh, Ehler had 206 victories during the war, flying in the, above the Arctic, uh, Norway and Finland, along with uh, his good buddy Walter Schuch, who is still alive in California. Uh, Ehler was court-martialed. Some people who have their knowledge of history intact will remember that the British uh, came in to the fjord at Trondheim and uh, at Trumpso and dropped a tall boy bomb and after several attempts finally sank the battleship Tirpitz. Well, Heinrich Ehrler's unit was designated to protect the Tirpitz from British air attacks. That failed. They wanted a scapegoat. He was the commanding officer. He was going up for court martial. Goering wanted him executed as an example. Hitler said, well, do whatever you got to do. But he had an advocate. And the advocate that he had was Gallen. And Gallen said, you can't execute a guy for not doing his duty when you gave him authorization to go on leave to be with his girlfriend. <laughs> so he got him out of a death sentence. As a result, he joined the Galland, flew with JV-44, and he was uh, killed in action. Uh, never returned from his last mission. That was also in uh, April of 45. Next slide. Now, this is Walter Shook. Uh, I'm still in contact with his daughter and her husband. Walter is the fellow who Joe Peterborough shot down in February of 45, probably saving Walter's life. Walter also had 206 victories during the war and flew with Ehler and Weissenberger and those guys. And Walter... In his last mission, uh, shot down four B-17s before Joe Peterburst in his P-51 Mustang bounced him and shot out one of his engines and forced him to bail out. Uh, Walter always said that, ironically enough, he loved the flying, but he hated the dying. And uh, But he flew with JG-7. He was a squadron leader. And because of his demeanor, let's just say, he never rose above the rank of first lieutenant because he made a few unpopular comments about the Nazi hierarchy, so he wasn't on the promotion list for about three or four years. But he was a good man and very successful with the jet. He had four, his four jet kills were scored on that one mission, and Joe Peterburst ended it for him because when he bailed out and landed, he broke both of his ankles. So he was out of the war. But then again, like I say, it probably saved his life. I managed to get with Court and put Joe Peterburst and Walter Schuch together uh, four, decade, four decades or so after the war, and uh, they became best friends. Once Walter looked into the eyes of the man that shot him down, he said to him in broken English, you shot me down. And Joe Peterburst made the comment, yes, but I didn't kill you. You owe me a beer. So that's a good story. Next slide. This is Franz Schall. Franz Schall was a very successful pilot. He flew with JG-7. Before that, he was with Commando Novotny. In fact, he was the first uh, group, uh, group and commander, uh, squadron leader, basically, uh, with JG-7 under, under Walter Novotny. And uh, he was shot down the day that Novotny was shot down. But the Franz Schall was a specialist in one thing and one thing only. He was very good at shooting down aircraft, but not killing the pilots. He was very, he was like Hans Marseille. Uh, who I wrote a book about. He always wanted to shoot the aircraft down, but he didn't want to really want to kill the pilot. And one of the pilots asked him once, he said, why are you so concerned about saving these men? He said, because they have cigarettes, American cigarettes. So anyway, that's a kind of a funny joke. But Franz Schall was one of the very successful pilots in the jet as well. But uh, he was not exactly a popular person with the upper echelons of, of Nazi Germany, you'll find most of the people who went to fly jets as fighters were the outcasts. They were the disposables. They didn't, Hitler and Goering said, oh, we'll wash our hands up. You go fly jets. We don't care what happens to you. And he was one of those guys. Novotny was one of the rare exceptions. He was specifically appointed 
And when he was appointed, he brought Franz Schau with him. Next slide. Now this is a good a good picture. This is my personal picture signed by Walter Kropinski and Adolf Galland. Now, if you look to the far left, the partial profile shot is Hannes Trautloff. He was the colonel who discovered the Buchenwald concentration camp. Uh, he was a, a rather successful pilot. He flew in Spain with Galland uh, and others. He only had 54 victories during the war, but that was because he was such a great administrator that he was placed in the duty of, of containing personnel and, and procuring equipment as a quartermaster. But he was also an effective pilot. Uh, he was so effective at his job, Gallen made him the inspector of day fighters. And that's how he actually found Buchenwald because uh, after a bombing raid, uh, Gallen said, well, you better go find out all these factories that were bombed and all these places, what was hit hard enough to stop the flow of ammunition, parachutes, uniforms. I need to know everything that's been damaged so I know exactly what to prepare for. And Troutloft went to inspect these these places and his driver made a wrong turn and they stumbled across this beautiful grove and looked and saw a barbed wire fence and a big gate in front of it. And he's like, oh, what the hell is this? And he discovered the concentration camp. And there was a documentary made about this called The Lost Airman of Buchenwald that was done. Very tastefully done, very well done. And uh, it's worth watching. History Channel did it. You can get it on YouTube, I think. But this is a picture of Galland welcoming Kropinski after he got out of the hospital to the unit and the other pilots that were volunteers or escapees from the, from the uh, hospital ward. And uh, that was the genesis of JV-44 in February of 1945. Uh, they went operational in March. And that was when they flew their first missions. Next slide. Now, this is a, a picture. This is just one of many meetings Galland had with Hitler. But this particular meeting was important because this is the picture in 1942, right after Galland had, had uh, led, planned, and executed Operation Cerberus. That was the Luftwaffe patrols to protect the cruisers Scharnhorst and Gneisenau up the channel dash. And he was so successful at it, that's when Hitler promoted him afterwards on the spot and said, okay, you're now a general, you know. And uh, at this point in time, Galland had become aware of the jet, but did not know its capabilities, had not flown it yet. And this meeting was when Galland said, I would like to know more about this jet. And Hitler said, in due time, you're going to go see it. You'll talk to Messer Schmidt, he'll tell you all about it. Next slide. This is Franz Stigler. Franz Stigler is a great, he was a great guy. He really was, I call him the cool dude. Uh, he flew in North Africa with the Hans Marseille and Gustav Rodel and those guys and Edward Neumann. Uh, my buddy Adam Akos wrote a book called A Higher Call where Franz is immortalized because in December of 44, he took off to shoot down a lone straggling B-17 in his 109. But when he saw how much damage was inflicted upon that bomber and he saw the dead tail gunner and he saw the blood on the side of the aircraft and could see holes through the fuselage, he flew on the left side, looked through, rolled over, flew on the right side, looked through and flew under and looked the entire aircraft over and could not believe it was still flying. He flew up alongside the cockpit. The pilot, Charles Brown, looked over at him. Franz looks over at him and Franz is pointing him in the direction of Sweden, which would have been less than 40 minutes flight time away from, from where they were over the North Sea. And Charlie's like shaking his head, pointing towards England. And Franz is shaking his head. I don't think you're going to make it anyway. So he escorted them over the North Sea as far as he could. And then he turned back. He never told anyone he never shot the B-17 down. He never claimed to be 17 shot down. Because if he had told them he didn't shoot it down, he could have been court-martialed and or executed. Charlie Brown landed his B-17 and told the story, and the crew corroborated it. And he was told by his, his G-2, the intelligence section, you can't say a word about this to anybody. We don't want anyone out there knowing that a German saved an American crew because they might get under the false impression that every German that comes close by is going to be as magnanimous. So it remained a big secret for decades. But Adam put it together. I introduced him to... Uh, Franz Stigler, and then he knew Charlie Brown. The two came together. Well, Franz and Charlie met years ago and became best of friends and toured the country. Franz lived in British Columbia, Canada, and Charlie lived here in the States. 
and they would do the circuit together talking about the event. And uh, it's just one of those heartwarming stories of a guy who didn't shoot down a bomber. And now there are like three or four generations of, of, of Americans who are alive because Franz decided not to pull the trigger. He flew JV-40 with JV-44. He called Galland up one day and said, hey, can I join your unit? He said, well, I don't have any, I don't have any more jets. He says, well, if I get one, can I join you? He goes, yeah, if you can get one. Franz said, okay. So Franz goes to, a, to the uh, factory and says, hey, where's this going? They said, we don't know. Oh, I'll take it. So he flies a jet with no paint on it straight to Gallen's uh, air base at Mina Shrine and uh, says, okay, now I'm, I'm with you guys. And that's how he joined JV-44. Next slide. Okay, this is Gerhard Barkhorn. Gerhard Barkhorn, uh, I never got a chance to meet him. He and his wife, Christy, died in a car accident a couple of years before I got to Germany, back in 81. Uh, but Gerhard had 300, 301 victories during the war. And uh, because he had uh, some issues with some of the hierarchy, uh, he was on disciplinary status. So he decided he was going to try to join up with anyone flying jets. So Gallen took him on board and said, come on, Garrett, you join us. We'll fly your jets. We'll, be, you know, we'll do what we can do. So he did. He joined and he flew as a uh, as a uh, as a squad, as an assistant squadron leader, as a flight leader. So. He flew with JV-44 until he had an incident uh, not long uh, after Steinhoff, uh, which I'll get to in a second. But uh, he his canopy wouldn't close, and he tried to close it. And as he tried to close the canopy, his throttle cable stuck. And on the 262 jet, on the old UMO engines, you didn't have throttle control. You couldn't just – you had to slowly increase the power by pulling the throttle back, or you had to slowly decrease it. Uh, by moving the throttle, you know, back and forth. But there was no RPM uh, control like on a piston-powered aircraft. If you tried to move the throttle too fast, you'd flame out both engines. And you had dual controls for both engines. And uh, his throttle control cable broke, so he had no control. And he had a pothole, and the canopy slammed down on him, and he was thrown to the side, and it almost broke his neck and decapitated him. So he was out of the war. But uh, Barkhorn was uh, very instrumental in uh, making his contacts to get uh, high-grade ammunition for the uh, for the 30-millimeter uh, cannon. Uh, and he, he had a cousin who worked in the Waffenfabrik that made that ammunition, and he sent him a, a message saying, do us a favor, save, save some of this really good stuff for us. And he did, so Gala was appreciative. Next slide. This is Theodore Weissenberger. Uh, Theo Weissenberger, as I mentioned before, flew with uh, JG-5 Eismere with uh, Heinrich Erler and Walter Schuck. Very successful pilot, another 206 victory ace. Uh, he uh, was a heavy drinker, smoked like a chimney, womanized when he could, but he, he was a very good pilot. He was liked by most of the people, but when he got to JG-7 and took over command, he rubbed everybody the wrong way. Uh, by that time, he was not what I would call mentally sound, uh, and he actually had an incident where he got into a bar fight uh, and was going to go to jail until Galland came and signed him off on bail and said, okay, I got a job for you. Put him in command of JG-7. Therefore, it's going to be kind of hard to arrest a guy for a bar fight when he's commanding a, a fighter squadron. So anyway, or a fighter wing, I should say. And uh, so he saved his career and probably saved it from a jail sentence. But Weissenberger was killed racing cars in Nuremberg uh, after the war. Uh, but he was uh, very successful as a jet pilot, had several kills, had a lot of damaged bombers. And uh, and he was another one of those guys after the war when he found out about the Holocaust, said, I, I can never wear a German uniform again. And he didn't. He didn't go back in the military. Next slide. Walter Kropinski. Wonderful, wonderful guy. And uh, Walter was uh, had 197 victories uh, with JG-52. His whole career was JG-52 until he transferred to the Western Front with JG-6. And uh, and then later transferred after he got shot down and wounded. He was in the hospital when Steinhoff and Gallen recruited him out of his hospital bed. In fact, uh, to get him out of the hospital, they actually had to steal crutches from another patient. So they got him out. And uh, got him into a car, got him into a cot in this little cottage, let him heal up, 
And then Walter, of course, began flying with JV-44 and uh, had a couple of victories in the jet. But uh, one thing about Walter Kopinski was that he was always broke. So his best friend uh, in JG-52, the famous Eric Hartman, said that Kropinski called Eric the bank because Eric always had money. And Gallen said, that's true. He borrowed money from me, and I still don't think he ever paid me back. Next slide. This is Hitler the day that uh, Walter Novotny received the diamonds to his Knight's Cross. This is, I think, was October of 43. He just scored his 250th victory. I think he was the first pilot to get to that score. And after that, he was placed on uh, instructor duty for a while in a propaganda tour going around Austria and Germany, kind of like a war bonds tour that our stars did and our heroes during World War II. But this is the ceremony where he received the diamonds. Uh, and just over a year later, uh, he would be dead. Next slide. This is Major Eric Rudorfer. Rudorfer flew uh, on the Easter, he flew the whole war, Poland, France, the Battle of Britain. He flew in North Africa. He flew in Italy, Sicily. He flew on the Russian front, uh, 224 victories. He was a natural when it came to assignments to the jet unit. When he arrived at Commando Novotny, he took over as executive officer to Theodor Weissenberger. And Rudorfer was quite successful. I believe he had 12 victories in the jet. Uh, I think there was one confirmed just about 10 years ago to give him perhaps 13. I'm not sure about that. Uh, I don't think it was officially confirmed in the records, but I'll give him the credit. So Rudorfer also has the distinction of just dying a couple of years ago. He was the last living German military man of World War II to hold the oak leaves and stores to the nice cross. And I believe he was 98. Uh, he was a good interview. He didn't speak English, so I had to polish up on my German. But uh, very interesting guy. Next slide. This is a diagram of the UMO 004 axial flow engine. Now, Hans von Ohain designed this engine. He designed the engine in theory. Dr. Anselm Franz pieced it together and made it work. Between the two of them, they created what you see here. Now, everyone knows that Frank Whittle, the British pilot and inventor, created the blueprint design and built the first prototype of a jet engine. That was in 1928, and he patented it in 1930. People all always believe that Hans von Ohain stole Frank Whittle's design. That's not true. Whittle's design was patented as a centrifugal flow engine, which is different from this. This is called an axial flow engine. And if you notice on the bottom drawing, the little turbine fans, the blades to the left, that is what an axial flow engine is. And you'll see that on modern jet engines today. The centrifugal flow of Frank Whittle didn't have that, so therefore it was a new design, but based upon and predicated upon Frank Whittle's theory of jet propulsion. Next slide. Here's an iconic image. This is a World wartime color photo. If I'm not mistaken, I believe this is Johannes Steinhoff's personal aircraft, the same aircraft that he would be in when he was on takeoff and hit a crater, impacted and his rockets exploded, his fuel ignited, and he was burned alive over 80% of his body. Uh, it's in the book in pretty good detail from various perspectives because Kropinski was flying behind him when he exploded and had to lift up with his gear still down, hoping not to collide. Uh, but that's his aircraft, and it's a very beautiful, nice photograph of that iconic design. Next slide. Now, this is an interesting photo, and I want to tell you why. What you have here is a photograph of the guys who created the Holocaust. But the reason why I have this photo in here is because Heinrich Himmler, sitting down in the center, went to Hitler in uh, September of 44 and told him that he could make the jet fighter program work if the SS controlled it and they trained SS officers who were more ideologically motivated with national socialist zeal to be fighter pilots. Of course, Hitler, you know, kind of like didn't laugh it off, but kind of like just dismissed it like, okay, that's one of Heinrich's ideas. But what Heinrich Himmler did 
was he tapped every single telephone with regard to the jet program to include Bombach and Peltz and Gallant and everyone else. He tapped their telephones to find out what they were talking about because he really wanted to control that jet program. And for what reason, we'll never know because he committed suicide after he was captured by the British in 1945. Now, the man standing up to his left, to his right, your left, is Reinhard Heydrich. I won't go into detail about him, but get the movie Anthropoid. It's 80% accurate. He was a butcher. The man to Heinrich's left, your right, is SS Lieutenant General Carl Wolf. Carl Wolf uh, actually escaped war crimes uh, charges and the Nuremberg tribunals uh, after the war. But he, I interviewed Wolf before he died, and he gave me a great ex explanation as to why Himmler, in his opinion, wanted the jet program to be under SS control. If it was under SS control, then there would be no way anyone could deny him all the material assets he needed to impress Hitler. That's the reason why Himmler, apparently, according to Wolf, wanted the jet program under his control. Next slide. Now, this is Ben Drew in the cockpit. Ben Drew is the guy. He was a really cool dude. We had a few scotches together one night, and he could drink. And I thought I could drink. But anyway, but Ben uh, shot down the two. He's holding two fingers. The two fingers are two jets, two 262s. Two he only got credit for one because no one saw the other one, and his gun camera failed to, failed to uh, record it. But the second victory would take almost 40 years to be confirmed for his Distinguished Service Cross when Georg Ader, the German jet pilot, became, who became his good friend, confirmed it in a letter and gave the information required for Drew to get his uh, Air Force Cross. And, uh, and I interviewed Georg Ader as he was handling cancer. And Ben Drew came over to Germany, and Ben and I were with Georg Ader. And then uh, after I left Germany, uh, Ben went back and was with Georg on his deathbed when he died. And uh, they were very good friends, despite being enemies. Next slide. This is the 262 uh, that was assigned to JG-7 and flown by four or five of the big pilots. Uh, and this is the National Air Space Museum aircraft in Washington, D.C. And it's a beautiful, beautiful aircraft. It really is. And it's all original. Uh, it's not airworthy. There are no airworthy 262s in the world today, unfortunately, but uh, the, our good friends in Virginia Beach have satisfied my insatiable appetite to see them fly, and for that I thank them. Next slide. This is a great guy. This is a guy I wished I could have interviewed. This is this is Shaw Moser. Now, Frank Shaw Moser, Heinrich Baer, you may remember him. He called him the rammer. Shaw Moser had five victories in the jet. All five were because he exhausted his ammunition and he rammed the bombers. He would ram his 262 jet into the bombers. Well, this picture is right after he had rammed his third his third B-17 and he jumped out of the cockpit as both aircraft were falling to earth. He just happened to open his parachute and land in his mother's backyard. The clothesline behind you Behind him in that picture is where he got you know, snared in his parachute. That's his mother's clothesline. That's where he landed. Talk about irony. He, in fact, he, she fed him, and he had his first home-cooked meal in months. Next slide. Now, here's someone we all know, Chuck Yeager. Brigadier General Charles Yeager uh, actually scored, I believe, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, the first 262 jet kill confirmed in World War II, and Yeager would have a couple of them. Uh, Jaeger uh, was always one of the guys who just seemed to have a lucky leprechaun on his shoulder. He just uh, managed to escape and evade even after he was shot down, go back to go back to combat. But Jaeger was very magnanimous in his appraisal of the skills of the German pilots. And, uh, and he's still alive, still lives in Northern California. And uh, I just thought I threw him up there because he's one of the guys I mentioned in the book. And he's just an iconic American hero. Next slide. This is Chuck Yeager's gun camera film. This is one of the 262s he brought down. And you can see the gun camera catches it right after he, he smokes out the, uh, the starboard engine. And that aircraft did go down. The pilot did survive, by the way. Uh, he managed to crash it on the nacelles and crawl out. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, next slide. This is Joe Peterburst. 
uh, P-51 pilot. He named his aircraft after his wife, Josephine. Joe, still li- he's still alive. He lives up near Sacramento. He's a good guy. And he and Walter Shook, whom he shot down in February, and as I said before, became good friends until Walter passed away in 2015. Uh, Joe uh, was not a top ace. He only had a couple of victories, but uh, but he's notable because he did engage Walter and taking out a top ace with 206 kills like that after four B-17 victories in that one mission is quite an accomplishment. Ironically, Joe had a cousin, a first cousin, flying in the Luftwaffe by the name of Peter Burst as well, who was a Knight's Cross recipient and a very successful fighter race who did not survive the war. Americans fighting, American fighting a German relative. And my family knows something about that as well. Next slide. This is Walter and Joe Peterburs, the first time they met when they got together in California. Look at them smiling. And this is before the alcohol. Joe is a great guy to talk to. And Walter was a great guy to converse with, you know, if you spoke German. And uh, they just hit it off remarkably. You'd almost never think that they tried to kill each other. And, uh, and those are the stories I like to bring to life. Former enemies coming together, just setting it aside. Next slide. Here they are again. There's Joe sitting in the P-51 Josephine. And there's Walter standing on the wing. They're giving the thumbs up because uh, when Walter was under his parachute, he gave Joe a thumbs up as Joe circled him and, and looked at him. Walter was kind of worried he was going to get shot in his parachute because some German pilots were killed in their parachutes uh, by by American pilots because they were considered high value targets. Joe just gave him a thumbs up and just waved at him. Didn't know who the hell he was, but 40 some odd years later, they get together and they became best friends. Next. This is a picture of, of the depicting uh, very accurately, according to both men, of Joe Peter Burst and his Mustang behind Walter in his yellow one of JG-7 after Walter had just shot down his fourth B-17. Uh, Joe got him and uh, he nails him. And there's Walter trying to get out in the slipstream. And the rest was history, as we say. But uh, it's a pretty good image, I think. Next slide. This is Buddy Hayden. I mentioned him before. Edward R. Buddy Hayden, Texas Cowboy. Uh, he's one of the interviews in my new book coming out later this year. He's the man who killed Walter Novotny. He also had a very interesting experience near Munich uh, going up against uh, two two six twos with his wingman, Dale Carter. Come to find out, he was in a, t- he was in a turning dogfight with two, with two jets, he and Dale Carter, and neither side could get an advantage over the other. And then finally... Buddy sees one jet peel off and try to go land, so he breaks off out of the circle and goes in and strafes this uh, 262 coming in for a landing. Doesn't know it, but I confirmed in my research that he did score the jet victory that he was never credited for. And uh, But the two pilots he went head-to-head against with Dale Carter were Theodore Weissenberger and Eric Rudorfer. So I told Buddy when I interviewed him, I said, you know, you're pretty damn lucky. <laughs> he goes, wow, those guys? Yeah, I guess so. Anyway, that was Buddy, and uh, I remember him finally. Next slide. This is a picture depicting uh, George Chipianka in his uh, Red Six under in Commando Belter. He was flying his 262 at night and managed to catch a, a mosquito on a bombing mission. The, this mosquito, particular mosquito, was a Pathfinder. The Pathfinder aircraft would fly to the target. They would drop flares, markers, small little incendiary bombs that would light up the ground that would tell all the other bombers in the stream coming behind where to drop their ordnance. Uh, George caught him and shot him down. After he shot him down, he actually managed to get the pilot, the co-pilot, and uh, and find out that the, the I believe both men survived. And uh, George uh, made sure they were taken care of medically and got a hot meal before they went to the prison camp. After the war, Jorg actually had to train a Captain Eric Brown of the Royal Air Force how to fly the 262 when they, as part of the captured Operation Paperclip program. So he taught Captain Eric Brown, uh, a former enemy, how to fly the 262, and they became lifelong friends up until Eric's death. Next slide. This is a picture of Johannes Steinhaus 262 after he tried to take off after an American air raid on his field, his nose wheel dug into a crater, his aircraft jumped in the air, stalled out, 
impacted, the fuel leaked, caught fire, and the rocket, the 24 R4M rockets exploded. And it, it, he was blown almost out of the cockpit. The only reason he didn't get ejected from the explosion was the canopy was still closed, but he was being roasted alive like in an oven. And, uh, but he survived and became uh, not only a good friend, but he became uh, one of the first NATO generals in command of NATO air defense. He passed away in 94, I believe. Next. Okay, I guess that's it. Uh, one thing I will say, though, is that once the war was over, there was a very massive program, as I mentioned, Operation Paperclip and Operation Lusty. Operation Lusty was the gathering of German technology. Operation Paperclip was the plan to gather all the scientists and technicians that we could find and get them out of Russian hands because we didn't want Stalin having that information, although Stalin's people did find, the NKVD did find a few of the technicians and scientists, and, and that's how they started their space program. But we got Werner von Braun, who created the Redstone program, the Gemini, Apollo, all of that's history. And we also got a lot of the jet pilots and the technicians who helped us build, essentially, our jet fighter force and bomber force. So that's a little sidebar. Well, thank you so much, Colin. Um, I think it's been eye-opening for a lot of us to hear the kind of German perspective on operating the 262. Um, if, if you've got a little bit of time, uh, we've definitely got a, a log filled with questions here from everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got one question here, and it actually uh, kind of echoes across several of those that have been asked. How exactly does a piston engine fighter shoot down a jet? Well, it depends. The tactic was to catch them either taking off or catch them landing because they were very vulnerable uh, in slowing down to land or very slow in the takeoff. And by the time a 262, an original 262 with the 004 Yumos took off, it took about 42 seconds from the time the wheels came off the ground and the landing gear locked in before the pilot could slowly accelerate that throttle to get full speed. 42 seconds is, a, is an eternity when you've got a Mustang or another fighter streaming in a 400 knots coming in on you from behind. Another way was catching them in the arc, meaning that if a German jet pilot made the mistake of trying to turn out of a combat, the piston pilot could easily, easily turn inside his turn and give a deflection shot and take him out. So shooting the jet in, in, in a turning curve or an arcing flight or even takeoff landing was not difficult. But they couldn't catch them in level flight, and they couldn't catch them in the climb, and they couldn't catch them in the dive. Um, we often hear stories about uh, slave laborers being used on technical projects like the engines, and that there was ultimately cases of sabotage. Uh, have you found anything in your research to indicate the truth behind that, or ever hear what the German pilots themselves thought about those stories? That's absolutely true. In fact, I'll give you an example. I actually interviewed a guy who's a French worker, a French Jewish slave laborer working uh, not far from Pina Monde, who was building V2 rocket engines. And the very V2 rocket that is in the National Air and Space Museum was a rocket this guy sabotaged, uh, tried to. But what they did, what he did was in the fin of the rocket, put a note giving the descriptive details of what was going on there. Just in case the rocket landed and was fired, that way if the fin was recovered, the note was recovered, then they would have the location of the plant, what was going on, everything was detailed. And uh, slave labor was about 40% of uh, the German war industry potential uh, after 1942. Uh, it started in 1940 with organization TOT and accelerated until 41. Tote was killed in an airplane crash. Albert Speer took over in 42 as armaments minister. And Albert Speer was told by Hitler, use every Jew, use every Frenchman, use everybody you can, but we need a labor force. And unfortunately, Heinrich Himmler and Adolf Eichmann and uh, Reinhard Heydrich decided they would rather gas and exterminate these people to use them as a labor force. And there's a very good movie that I suggest people watch. It was an HBO presentation called Conspiracy about the Vonsei Conference on January 20th, 1942. And that movie is 
one of the most historically accurate you'll ever see because it's taken from the minutes kept by a stenographer. Watch that film about how they created the Holocaust in two hours and you will understand the slave labor versus extermination discussion. Thank you for that recommendation. I think it's probably a movie familiar to a number of our listeners, but a great recommendation for, for those who haven't watched it. Colin, um, did you conduct the majority of your interviews with these pilots here in the United States, or did you have to track them down in Europe? You mentioned arriving in Germany earlier. Yeah, I was in the Army for a few years, and then later I was in the Marine Corps. But uh, when I was in the Army, I had a great uh, – well, let me back up a bit. When I was in high school, I began writing letters to publishers. When I read a book written by somebody, I wanted to try to contact the author. One of those authors was Walter Dornberger. People may know him as the project manager for the V2 rocket program at Pina Munde. Werner von Braun worked for him. Well, I communicate with von, with, uh, with uh, Dornberger through letters, as well as SS General Wilhelm Beatrich, who was played by Maximilian Schell in A Bridge Too Far, uh, and some others. Well, I wrote to the publisher of a book called Harito, and I got a nice letter from a guy by the name of Colonel Raymond Tolliver. And this was in 1977. After that, Ray became kind of a mentor to me and said, uh, and in 83, when I found out I was going to Germany in the Army, he said, hey, do you want to talk to some of the guys? Well, hell, that's like asking a crack addict if he wants keys to the pharmacy. I'm like, yeah, I'll go. Sure. And uh, so he made some phone calls, wrote some letters for me. And he basically started my career. And 400 interviews later and 13 books, I'm still working, you know. That's a great segue into telling us a little bit more about your published works. Um, can you perhaps tell us a little bit about some of your your works that you would recommend for people just kind of becoming familiar with your body of work and also where to get them? Well, that depends on your interest. If you like aviation, my book, uh, The Stormbird, of course, covers interviews I did with about 20 German jet pilots and about almost as many Allied pilots. Uh, but the, my German Aces Speak series, German Aces Speak and German Aces Speak Volume 2 are direct interviews with uh, some of the men that I had slides on. Steinhoff, Kripinski, Galland uh, is uh, the first person interview uh, done in Q&A format, question answer without, without the question. So basically, it's all their first person responses uh, edited uh, by syntax, not material structured and those books you might find interesting uh, and if you like aviation biographies written about pilots with the assistance of their colleagues my book the star of africa the book on hans york and marseille uh, i interviewed all the guys still alive who flew combat with him and some of the guys who flew against him and the guy was a complete nut but he was a lovable nut in fact we have some production interest for for turning that into a movie uh a remake of the not a remake of the 57 black and white film but a true actual actual historically factual book of, uh, a movie about him so that book the star of africa people might enjoy reading because it has all of the details of combat his practical jokes uh, his hatred of the nazis he j anyway i'm not going to say any more just read the book you'll see what i'm talking about uh i did a book on vietnam my former commanding officer my colonel back when i was a marine sniper i was a, i was a sniper in the marine corps and my former colonel now retired major general james Li james livingston uh asked me to help him write his autobiography noble warrior so that's a vietnam era book that's not aviation uh but i have several books out there covering different biographical subjects uh, and i think the aviation books have always always carried a lot of interest because Unlike most writers who write from the primary source material or from secondary source material collection, I, I went to the guys. I used their words. It's, it's what they had to say. It's one thing to write a write a book about someone like like a Gallen and say, oh, well, Adolf Gallen, born 1912, had three brothers, two were fighter pilots with him. Both were, you know, you can write a book about anybody. But when you sat down with the guy himself and he's telling you his, in his own words what he thought and what he experienced, it's a whole different dynamic when it comes to putting it on the open market because people can read what these guys had to say in their own words. And that's what I want to do, put their own words out there. 
it certainly gives a tremendous, tremendously interesting historical perspective to understand the emotions uh, attached to so much of this, which leads us into our next question. Um, did you have any sense of whether or not those that ended up flying jets might have preferred to instead be flying an FW-190 or, or a BF-109 derivative? Yeah, a couple of them. A couple of them were like, or Walter Kropinski said, oh, flying the jet was fine, but if you lost an engine, it was like flying a brick. Uh, so yeah, uh, Gunther Rall flew the 262, trained in it, but uh, he didn't want to fly it in combat. He went back to flying, uh, actually, he went back to flying F FW-190 Doras uh, after years of flying 109s, but uh, he preferred the piston-powered aircraft to the jet. He didn't trust the engines. He had two flame out on him. He's like, no, I don't think so. So yeah, there were some guys who preferred the the piston-powered aircraft. Every, every pilot has his personal favorite aircraft. Uh, Gunther just liked everything but a jet until he got into the American-made models of like the F-104, the F-4, things like that, that were more technologically sound and more sound than the early German engines. But uh, yeah, I would say Gunther was probably, Gunther and Walter were probably two of those guys. On the subject of engines, the, the UMO gets often maligned in, in the history books. Um, how much of that do you think is deserved? It is a, a very early iteration of a very complex engine. Um, do, do you think we have a right to it? Would German pilots have had a right to have expected it to perform better? No, not really, because the, they didn't have cobalt. Understand if you understand metallurgy, uh, look at how important cobalt is to strengthening steel, hardening it for high temperatures. Uh, they understood the limitations of the engine. That's why they, if they got 20 hours, 25 hours out of an engine, that was extraordinary. The average is 15. Uh, that's why when Galland formed his unit, he said, "Okay, I've got 24 jets, but I need 100 engines," because <laughs> he knew they weren't going to last long. And uh, but most of the guys were willing to take the risk. I mean, they they knew that losing an engine in combat was bad. I mean, with two engines, you were 100 miles per hour faster than a Mustang. You're flying at 540 miles per hour. Lose one engine, you're 100 miles per hour slower than a Mustang and a lot less maneuverable. So you're best, best to bail out because you might not make it back to base because they're waiting for you. They know where your base is. So yeah, there were some detriments with regard to the engines and, and, and the malignment of it, I think is warranted if you're a pilot of it because you have to live with it. But if you're not a pilot of it, just accept the fact that it was high technology far beyond the capabilities of the time. With that in mind, do you think it was a mistake to focus resources on these jet projects when they did? No, I do not. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it, it depends upon how you approach the question. If you think that putting the jet into the air was going to win the war for the Germans, that was a fantasy. It wasn't going to happen. But what it did do, what it did do was it accelerated the jet age and gave birth to the space age. It might not have benefited the Germans very much, but it sure as hell helped us with regard to, to building an efficient and effective air force during the Cold War. The Soviets put a man in space first, but they didn't break supersonic flight before we did. So I would say yes. If you want to look at the global long range historical perspective of was it worth it, I would say yes. How competitive was the German jet industry? Were the manufacturers sharing information about what worked and what didn't, or were they kind of keeping keeping close hold their advances and breakthroughs? Oh no. Mr. Schmidt didn't share anything. Oh hell no. He Mr. Schmidt did not even want uh his competitors to know how he put his airframe together. I mean, back in those days, uh, flush flush riveting was being used. But what Buster Smith did was flush riveting with bead welding. He wanted to have a very strong airframe. I mean, he didn't want to share he, he didn't want to share any information with his people. And Hugo Junkers was the same way. They were all cloistered. They all kept their secrets. Uh, but then again, I mean. Military secrets, te technical secrets are, are fleeting. It's kind of like you're going to buy a dress for the prom, or you don't think every other girl's probably seen you dancing around in it before you get there. Everybody knows what everybody else had, but it's just one of those things. We historians do it as well for the most part. I don't. I share my research with people freely. I don't even ask for money. Uh, 
uh, if it's not published, I won't give it to you. But if it's going to be published and it's, you know, data, I'll share it with you. But mo for the most part, yes, they did cloister their information. They didn't share information, which, by the way, was very different from the American industry because our people were directed by the White House to share information to accelerate the process of building mach machinery and materiel. Obviously, the Americans knew where to find the jet bases uh, late in the war, and the Germans did make efforts to protect their jet bases and protect the 262's landing. Can you speak to the success or failure of, of that as an operation? It wasn't very successful at all. In fact, uh, every single 262 jet base was supposed to have piston-powered uh, protection on takeoff and landing. Uh, for the most part, it was Focke-Wulfs and Messerschmitts. But in, in many cases, they were FW-190 Doras, the D models, because they were the only ones that were capable of actually tackling a P-51 Mustang or a Spitfire 9 uh, on, her, on its own terms. And uh, Hans Dortenmann became famous for shooting down almost all his aircraft by covering jet landings uh, for Galland. But uh, but no, it, 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 was, it was pretty much... A failure because you might have five or six uh, piston-powered fighters orbiting, covering a takeoff or a landing, but there's very little they can do when 20 Thunderbolts, Mustangs, or Lightnings, or Hawker Tempests, or whatever, descend upon the airfield and start just strafing everything in sight. It, it had to be done, but it just wasn't done that effectively. Okay, um, another question here that relates to the interception of a relatively slow-moving bomber. Uh, how much special training was required to get the knack for shooting down those bombers when the rate of closure from the jet was just so tremendous? Well, I, I tell you exactly from Adolf Gatlin's own words. He, in his first six or seven engagements, he didn't hit a single target because he could not adjust the gun sight for the speed he was flying. And he realized <clears throat> that Without specialized training to compensate for the speed of the aircraft, that they weren't going to be very successful unless they closed in very closely. And that also had its problems because the closer you get to a, to a heavy bomber, the closer you are to the gunners on that bomber. And uh, so they actually had issues. Not, uh, most of the guys who flew the 262 did not become high scoring aces for a reason. That high speed and angle of attack. Uh, reduce their firing time. They, by the time they got within range of about a thousand yards, they within three seconds they're half that distance. That gives them about one and a half to two seconds to pull the trigger and hit something and then break away or get caught by defensive fire or or an escort fighter. So it was very difficult. And the only way they compensated for that was when they used the R4M rockets. Steinhall particular said that the first time he fired his rockets into a formation of bombers he said it was like a shotgun bursting into geese it was incredible but he didn't hit a damn thing with his gun convincing pilots to get into an airplane that has a documented history of engine trouble after the kind of 15 hour mark um, did the germans have to do anything in particular to um, restrict pilot access to engine maintenance logs or anything like that so that they weren't aware of how much time was left on each engine? Oh, no, they all knew. That wasn't secret. In fact, they had, they had classes telling the pilots, logging the hours, that after the 12th or 15th hour, to do a, a total inspection on the engines. They had their crew chiefs do it. Can you speak a little bit about the impact of fuel scarcity on Messerschmitt 262 operations? Well, that's been a big controversy, and let me tell you that it's rubbish. Okay, first of all, the reason why there was no fuel scarcity for the 262s was because they didn't run off high-octane fuel. That really crippled the piston fighter force because if you don't have, you know, 104 octane, you're not flying anything. And even if you did have the fuel, you still had to move it by rail or by road, and if it moved in daylight, it was getting strafed. I mean, nothing German was safe anywhere in Western Europe with the 8th and and, and Ninth Air Force is flying overhead with tactical and strategic bombing. Uh, it wasn't going to happen. But see, the 262 flew off kerosene. It, it flew off. It, it, you could even mix vodka with pine tar and, and distill it, and you could fly it. It was a very cheap fuel. It wasn't expensive. It was readily available. You didn't have to have oil wells, refineries. All you had to have was a, was a bunch of lamp oil and, or, or kerosene, and you could just pump it in that sucker. <laughs> 
and it would it would work. You just had to get it to the airfield. And again, if it moved in daylight, it was strafed uh, because of the sort of Allied air forces operating over Germany. Um, what kind of flight time or range did the 262 have? <clears throat> well, that depended on several factors. It depended upon whether or not you, you maintained level flight or if you engaged in combat. Normally, 90 minutes was about the limit, and that's not a lot of time. Uh, and if you were a bomber, if you were in KG-54 or KG-51 or one of the one of the bomber units, you had less time than that because you're carrying, you know, a couple of thousand pounds under your under your airframe. Uh, so th th they were nothing more than interceptors. They weren't escort fighters like like the Mustang. They weren't uh, tactical fighters like uh, the Spitfire or the Tempest or the Thunderbolt. They were strictly interceptors. Uh, there was they had no longevity. They had no legs. They had they had no long wind range. Uh, they were pretty much handicapped. That's why most crashes, most of the guys who bailed out of their of their jets were normally less than two or three hours truck ride from the airfield they took off from. Certainly an interesting uh, facet of the war for the Germans was to be fighting kind of directly over your bases. Um, our our 262 replica is painted as white three. Did you ever have the opportunity to to interview Mutka? Mutka, no. I know who, I know who Mutka is, and I I I I, I well, was. I mean, I I think he's I think he's passed away now. Uh, I, I I know who he was. I never had the chance to interview him, and that was one of the few guys I I could not get because of circumstances. Uh, I believe he flew with seven third staffel, if I remember correctly, uh, for a while. But no, I never got a chance to meet him. Okay, um, we've got we've had a couple questions about um, embracing the challenges of those early jet engines. How easy were they to change? Oh, very easy. Uh, let me give you an example. If you were to change the engine in a Messerschmitt 109, you're talking about two days. Uh, if you're talking about a 109, a 190 air-cooled engine, one day. Uh, you could change out one of the UMO engines on a 262 in 45 minutes. That's certainly an impressive accomplishment. Colin, our last question for this evening um, is, what is the most interesting thing you've learned in your research and the time spent with the pilots? Was there anything that, that totally took you by surprise or reversed the path of the more conventional narrative? Yeah. I would say that of the 400 plus interviews I conducted, over 100 Luftwaffe pilots, of which 30 were jet pilots, I never met a single one who said he was glad he fought the war. I think that's a that's a sobering note on which to end it. Uh, Colin, thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, thank you for for your effort and your research and your conducting of these oral history interviews. No doubt, many of the pilots you spoke to um, would have had facets of their story lost had it not been for your efforts. So, thank you so very much for for all that you've done for military aviation history. Oh, no problem. Well, just wait till my U-boat commander interviews come out. <laughs> Oh, we are eagerly awaiting. We had a webinar session uh, just a few weeks back on the U-boats that were lost off of the coast here, off the Outer Banks. I'm Keegan Chetwin, the Military Aviation Museum's new director, and thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you.